Hello, my name is Barbara Hartley, Executive Director of the Downtown Arts District. I am in the historic Rogers Keeney Building, which is a beautiful home of City Arts Orlando. In 2020, Downtown Orlando was the site of multiple Black Lives Matter protests. In the heat of the summer, the streets were electric, with passionate individuals marching for justice. Since City Arts is located right on the corner of Pine Street and Magnolia Avenue, our building was a common stop for protesters to take a break, drink some water, and cool down. As a team, we were extremely proud to know that many individuals considered City Arts a safe space, but after giving it careful thought, we knew we could do much more. In the summer of 2020, the Downtown Arts District made a statement on behalf of the staff and board of directors saying the organization is committed to listening and doing. With the guidance of board members and community advocates, we developed a program called Access, Being Black in the Art World. We launched Access back in July of 2020 with multiple exhibitions and multiple virtual talks. I'm proud to welcome you to our current exhibit called Roots Haizej, curated by Sorcha Beatty and featuring the work of Chris Santos. Hi, my name is Sorcha Beatty. I'm a local curator here in Orlando, Florida, and I wanted to welcome everybody to this exhibit. It's called Roots. It is a solo exhibition by a fantastic artist, Chris Santos. Um, you know, it's happening in Black History Month, which is very important to highlight not only a black artist, but black art here in our local community. So this collection of works are all new by the artists. They're gonna be a mixture of paintings, sculpture, even tapestry works. Um, and this show kind of came together. Actually, you know, peak COVID is when the conversation kind of started. I was fortunate enough to meet up with Chris and we were talking a lot about what was happening in the art world, things that we would like to see change, things that we would like to see reflected within our community. And I simply posed the question of, if you had a solo show, what would that look like? And after that conversation and sitting there talking about, you know, things that he was very passionate to share with an audience, the show kind of got brought to life. So we're really excited to be here, um, you know, both in the city that we live in, to be able to share all of these works with our community. So I am an independent curator here in Orlando, Florida. I first got into the world of curating through my background. My education was in art history. Um, and through there, I went to grad school for arts administration. I have been working in and around the gallery world for the past 12 years. Um, I worked in Jacksonville, Florida as a gallery director and also briefly at a gallery here in the local community as a gallery director curating shows. Um, for me, the importance of being a curator is being able to share stories, share artists' views, their passions, um, and make it just presented in a way that audiences can really enjoy can kind of dig into the deeper meanings of the pieces and really get an opportunity to interact and engage with the artist. Um, being a black curator is specifically important because growing up in this industry and you know being in the art world now, there is not a lot of diversity, there's not a lot of inclusion, so being able to stand here proudly as a black female curator, it's really important to me to share stories very important for me to share black stories as well. So I'm excited and happy for you guys to share this story with us. Welcome to City Arts for our virtual tour of the solo exhibition Roots by Chris Santos. Okay. So now I am proud to introduce you to our featured artist for this show, Chris Santos. <laughs> so Chris is gonna be taking us through his works and telling us a little bit about you know, the pieces and the importance and the significance of this show. Awesome. Thank you, Sorsha. Um, I want to welcome you all to Roots Haizish. This is a show about me, my culture as an African American and as a first generation Cape Verdean American. Um, originally, I'm from New York, came down here for graduate school at UCF, graduated with my master's in fine arts back in 2018. Since then, I have taught at UCF for a couple years as an adjunct professor. And now currently I'm focusing 
uh, my talent, my time, or my craft. Um, with that being said, the work that I create is a work about two different cultures submerged into one to create essentially who I am in this world that we live in. So we have a very heavily Cape Verdean um, influence in the work as well as a very heavy African-American influence in the work. Um, and everything kind of merges together um, to create the work that you're going to see today. Um, All right, so Chris, let's talk about what is pretty much the, the flyer that we've been promoting all over social media. This is the piece that, you know, for anybody who has been following the show and being excited about the show has probably seen um, All Star. Nice, yes. So this painting that I created is entitled All Star. Um, and the reason behind this painting is the idea of how as African Americans and people of color, we like to embellish ourselves with materials to make us feel better about ourselves uh, in the sense of like status. So with this piece, um, what you see is a pair of all-star Chuck Taylors, which are a very common shoe that a lot of people get. Actually, I'm wearing a pair right now. Um, and <laughs> it's hanging from a power line. Um, the significance behind this is the idea that yes, while we also try to embellish ourselves with these material items, not only are we uplifting ourselves internally, but we're also putting ourselves in a position where things that are negative can also happen. Um, with the idea behind hanging it from a power line comes um, the idea that we can put ourselves in a harmful situation just trying to up, like appease other people's uh, views of ourselves. Um, so that's where that kind of comes into play. And then we have the mark making in the background that also ties back into the African culture. Um, in Cape Verde, something that I think would be really interesting for you to know, um, a lot of the shoes and a lot of the clothes that they have on the islands are actually reproductions and what we would call knockoffs. Um, so when you have a, a piece of material that is real and tangible that you get from what they would say the States, um, they call it original, which means original, as you could probably understand. Um, so when you get that, it almost elevates your status to something even more grandiose, um, even if it's something just as simple as a pair of Chuck Taylors. So that's kind of how this whole thing kind of marries in together to kind of tell that story of African-American and Cape Verdean culture combined. All right, so now we are going to mask up and take you guys on a tour of the works for the show. Mr. Santos, since we kind of talked about the shoes and these shoes being ones that you actually own, this was the other piece that we were talking about, royalty blues. So. Tell me a little bit, I'm sure like, you know, very similar to what we have on the front there. Yes. You're highlighting and showcasing the duality of, you know, both your Camp Verde culture, your African-American culture, the kicks, the influence and the significance of the power lines. Mm -hmm. Again, a little bit of the markings. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that you want to go in depth about on this piece? Uh, sure, so in black culture, African-American culture, however you want to call it, a staple shoe are always anything Jordan. So when I had the chance to get my hands on a pair of Jordans, these were my very first pair of Jordans. Oof. The Jordan 1 Royal Blues. And it's interesting that they're even called the Royal Blues because yes, the idea is the color is royal. Right. But when you wear them, you feel almost this sense of What's the word I'm looking for? Regality? Regal? Yeah, regality. Yeah, regality. Yeah. You know, you, you feel uplifted. You feel like, you know, you're the man I mean, or woman in a fresh pair of kicks. Yeah. So it's all about creating that sense of status within yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what this is about. Um, and I chose to use dark colors because the, the, the all-star one is a very much almost like a daytime scene. Okay. So this one is more of like a nighttime scene. The colors are very cool, very dark. Um, and it also ties in with the idea of it also being, you know, uh, it can also be seen as something negative too, um, with the idea of royalty blues, because, you know, when you wear a pair of shoes like this, you do draw a lot of attention. And sometimes the attention is not always positive, even though you might want it to be, sometimes you draw a negative attention, you know, um, exactly. So since that, you know, the idea of being a target is presented, yes, you could easily, get jumped, 
getting mugged, get robbed for the shoes that you wore to make yourself feel better because someone else doesn't have them, they want to make themselves feel better. And that's just the reality of life in the world we live in. So that's the idea behind royalty blues. It's yes, you're, you're putting them on to have this greater sense of self, but like the other uh, painting I spoke about, you're also putting yourself in a position that it might end up being a little dangerous for you. Um, and that's just the reality of life. I feel like every sneaker head will appreciate this and the piece <laughs> on the front, this, mm -hmm. you know, that status, that, that feeling of like, I've made it because mm -hmm. I have my Jordans or I have Absolutely. Like, you know, those kicks to kind of Absolutely. There's nothing, there's nothing better than opening a fresh box of shoes, putting them on your feet. You just feel so uplifted. You feel like a new person. And I think that's the whole idea with black culture and the way we embellish ourselves with clothes and jewelry. It's to make us feel better and to elevate our own status within ourselves and to others who, who, uh, who look at us. Cool. So we're going to turn around. Let's talk about this piece here. I actually emailed you about this one yes. because again this piece I, I love it I love what you've done here I love the color and I love the composition I love the the writing that you've had on it as well and when I first saw it you know I asked you if this was um, you know in reference to the disproportionate black and brown communities that have been heavily impacted mm -hmm. by COVID. Absolutely. Just because we have, you know, the writing, and I don't know how well it's coming across from you guys, but it says wear a mask. Um, and you told me, you know, again, with every piece that you guys will see in this show, it has duality to it. So it doesn't have just one straight meaning. And you said it was a little bit about that, but mm -hmm. you also said something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like Sorcerer said, the, the work is about the disproportionate effects that COVID has had on African communities and communities of color in general. But it's also about wearing a mask. Not necessarily just these types of masks, but a mask that allows you to walk the world freely and be safe in it. So as people of color, we've been taught since a very young age essentially to wear masks or to code switch in order to make it through the day and make it home safe. I know as a kid growing up, my mother and father used to always tell me, um, you know, whenever you're in contact with the police, it's yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. Don't give them any reason to think of you otherwise. And your job really is to make it home safe. So the idea about wearing masks is it's, it's a call to people of color to wear masks because it keeps you safe, not only like here, but outside in the real world. And it also helps open doors, unfortunate as that is, because we have to portray ourselves in a way to make other people more comfortable with who we are in order for them to give us certain opportunities. And I mean, like I said, that's just the reality of the life that we live as African-Americans, as people of color in this society. So yes, so wear masks is about, you know, the disproportion um, in the effects on African-American and brown communities, as well as, again, the code, switching we all have to code switching in order to just make it through the day. At the end of the day, it's all about making it home and being alive to be with your family. So that's what wear masks is about. And the actual significance of the mask that you portray, yeah. because obviously it's not like the ones that we No, no, right not now. at all, not at all. <laughs> so the reason, and you'll see this in a couple of my other pieces, I use this mask, and I actually have this mask at home. Um, I use this mask to represent people of color, um, especially African Americans. Now, when I paint these masks, it's all gonna be a little bit different because yes, they represent a people, but we're not all the same. We're not, it's not this one monolithic kind of idea between African Americans. You know, we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different looks and shades and, you know, personalities um, and ideals that come with us. So each of these masks are gonna be a little bit different, but they're all rooted in the same thing. It's all rooted back to this African mask that really represents who we are as a people. And so moving to wear masks two, where we kind of had very bold, in your face, kind of the call to wear a mask. Here, we have it only shown once, mm -hmm. definitely shown smaller. Yes. You know, again, kind of going from a bright piece to a darker piece here. Mm -hmm. Talk about the importance of, again, kind of giving you the, yeah. the opportunity to see both. <clears throat> so with the piece that we just saw, Mask One, that's really more about um, telling you to 
really wear a mask. I mean, they're both about telling you to wear a mask, but this one is definitely more uh, aggressive with it because it's really trying to tell you that, you know, without that, there is no way to make it safe in this world. With this one, I think this one, I, I created it to be a little more cooler, a little bit less intense, because while this one is telling you about making a home safe, I feel like this one is more about making people comfortable, right? So the colors I use for this are very intense, they're very vibrant, they really get, you know, kind of like a, your anxiety levels up a little bit, especially with the re repetition of the words kind of circling through the image. With this one, it's very simple, it's almost low key. Yeah. And that's almost like the same way we have to be when we code switch. We have to be able to slightly just turn it on and then turn it off. When we walk into a boardroom meeting, it turns on. When we walk into a classroom, it turns on. When we go outside and hang out with our friends, it turns off. When we go hang out with family, it turns off. So these are definitely two um, versions of code switching. Um, one to really make it safe and one is almost a little bit more subtle that you don't necessarily notice it, um, but we know it's happening, mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the things that I really love about this show is that, again, like you mentioned, it's Black History Month, these are black stories, yes. but the black race, the black people are not monolithic. We're not all from the same place. Right. You're from Camp Verde, I'm from the South, we have friends who are from completely different places, but again, in America, we're all kind of tied together as Absolutely. black. That's it, that's all we get. Absolutely. So I really love that for this show, we're able to kind of really dive deep into your culture, your history. And so you'll notice from the title of the show to the pieces that we're about to step into now, you'll notice that we are using, you know, your native tongue with these, and I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try, <laughs> so that? Yes. Okay. Yes, good. So we're walking into um, some pieces that again, in the lettering, the wording of them, and we'll talk about the meanings, uh, the actual literal meanings of these pieces, but I, I really appreciate that we're able to kind of mix both of these together. So let's talk about this piece. Okay, so here we have Sodad, and it means longing. So there's a very famous Cape Verdean singer by the name of Cesaria Evora, who had a very popular song um, called Sodad. And it's really just talking about how as, as Cape Verdeans, there are more Cape Verdeans that live actually outside of the country than actually that live within the country. A lot of them are in Europe, a lot of them are in the Northeast, in America. So the idea of Sodad is longing, it's missing your motherland, it's missing your homeland. You know, we leave in order to find better opportunities in life, but we always, there's always that sense of missing and longing for, you know, home, yeah. So with this piece, I draw a lot of inspiration from uh, mark making, African mark making, as well as graffiti too, because it's all really mark making and they kind of tie in together really well. Um, vibrant, bright colors that you'll see in a lot of African tapestries mm -hmm. and in a lot of graffiti. So they, they kind of go really hand in hand. So I kind of try to marry those two to create my own um, language on the canvas. So with these, you have like the sea turtle, which is a very important um, animal in Cape Verdean culture. It's even on some of the money. Um, they're, a very, they're a protected uh, species in Cape Verde that they actually come to Cape Verde just to lay their eggs and then they go uh, about you know, their way. Um, much like us as a people, you know, we come to different countries in order to give birth and grow life into our, our seeds to give them a better opportunity at life and then we leave. Um, also with this, it's, this is what they call a pilon, which you'll see some more of these that I made and it's, um, what do they call a mortar? Yeah, like a mor our mortar and pestle type thing. Yes, 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 a mortar and pestle. <laughs> see, I know it as one thing, you guys know it as another. But you see it, and yes, it's like, I know it exactly makes sense. what that is. So with that, you know, um, that is the heartbeat of k Birdie, is the food, it's the culture. With us, you know, as a, as a country, a lot, of the, a lot of the food that we eat is very much grown from the earth. So it's very corn heavy, it's very potato heavy, rice. So with this, a lot of our meals and beans, heavy on the beans. Mm -hmm. So with this, a lot of our meals come from this vessel. So that is a representation of the food. It's a representation of the culture. So it brings, I mean, I'm almost getting like nostalgic just thinking about it. Like I wanna go back just to sit down at the table with my family and just have, exactly, yeah. have an amazing meal together because it's, it's definitely a communal experience. Um, 
You have the boats, the fishing boats. Um, we don't actually have any natural resources in Cape Verde. Um, so the ocean is really our bloodline. So a lot of the, the food is fresh from the sea. A lot of fish, a lot of tuna, um, mackerel. And these are the way people make their living. There's people that just wake up before the sun comes up, just go out on their boats, fish, and then they sell it at the market. Um, and that's a lot of people. That's a reality of a lot of lives in Cape Verde. And then we have like the surfboard, again, tying into um, the, ocean, the ocean life. A lot of the younger kids that live there, um, they're very into like skimboard, skimboarding and surfing. And it's, it's actually now in popular culture, it's become a very sought after destination for actually like international surfers to go wow. and uh, yeah, catch some waves. And once again, we have the mask just to represent the people. Good. And then so now we move to Amazad? Yes, Amazad. 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 Close, go up here. So Amizad is, uh, it's about friendship. It's about loving one another. Um, so with this, um, I created these different icons that I thought represent that, right? So here we have sugarcane stocks. With the sugarcane, there's multiple layers to the sugarcane in Cape Verdean culture. So as a kid, I remember growing up in my dad's country, on my dad's island, because it's a bunch of different islands, on my dad's island, and then they would take a machete, chop off you know, a piece of sugar cane, peel it, cut it up into little pieces, and they'd give it out to the little kids. So we'd all be kind of just sitting there chewing on some sugar cane. And it's a very communal thing. So it's, it's, you build relationships with these people by these, you know, um, these, these events, by being engaged with them. And when you get older, they turn that sugar cane into rum. So now we have what we call grog or aguardent. And then that's what you'll normally see a lot of the older gentlemen sitting out by the table, playing cards, having their little shot, and they're always back to back. And, they, they, and they'll, send, they'll spend all day just playing cards, or what we call uril, which is essentially our version of like mancala that you guys play here. So that's what this is. It's an uril board, I guess you would call it. Um, so these and this almost go like hand in hand. You, you almost never see an old Cape Verdean man without, if he's playing this, he's drinking this. Love it. Almost nine times out of 10, That's a good time. without a doubt, absolutely. <laughs> so um, we also have here like an aloe vera plant, which is um, very important in our, in our culture. Um, it's a plant of healing um, and it has a lot of medicinal uses to them. I, I even remember as a kid, uh, I'd get like a burn on my arm from doing things I probably wasn't supposed to be doing. And then my mom would just take a little break, she would break off a little piece of aloe and then just rub it on the skin and it would help kind of just heal it. So with that, it's like, whenever I think of aloe, I think of healing. I think of someone helping somebody else. Nurturing. And it's nurturing. It's also like a form of friendship. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. And then of course we have the heart. It's just, it's all love. In yeah. Cape Verdean culture, so you have amizad and then we have this saying called morabeza, which is essentially like hospitality. It's almost like brotherly love. Mm -hmm. Like how Philadelphia has that slogan. Morabeza is that kind of embodiment of brotherly love. So whenever you go to the country, there's always people, even though we don't have a lot, they're always welcoming, they always have their doors open. You know, if you need some water, they'll get you some water. You hungry, come sit down, eat with us. It's, it's, it's love, it's sheer just love and friendship for you know, your brother and your sister. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, we have another representation of the mass to represent the people. So Chris, when I feel like it first was introduced to your work, the thing that kind of stood out to me the most was these like life-size sculptures that you were making. And first the size of them and then also the medium of them. So I have been in love with them ever since. I love this piece that you kind of were able to show a little bit on your social media about, mm -hmm. but I'm glad that you kind of left it um, so that we could all just really bask in just the magnificence of this piece mm -hmm. and the fact that we have it positioned at the front of the gallery so that everybody walking from the street can see that it's one of the first things that you encounter uh, is really great. So could you please tell us about Mother God, Mother God, Mother Queen God. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's fine. So yes, so this piece really speaks about um, in my, I grew up in a, in a house raised by women. I've almost like, feels like hundreds of aunts 
because both of my parents are from really big families, so I was raised heavily by African women. Um, and the material that I decided to use was cardboard. Um, and the reason why I work in cardboard is because it's a byproduct of wood. And these sculptures were inspired by these little African, scar these little African carvings that we used to have in the house when I was a kid. And when I was a little older, I found out that they weren't like real, like genuine, like African sculptures. They were like these very um, kitschy, mass produced pieces that they sell to tourists. Mm. So it wasn't until I got older that I found that out. So with this, what I do is I, I think of it in the terms of what was the original and what are the byproducts of the original. So the original African works are hand carved by the uh, indigenous African Americans, or Africans, I should say, not African Americans. And they're used for very important things, you know, ceremonies, rites of passage, um, things of that nature. Um, so when I saw what I had at home, I thought that's what it was about. But in reality, it wasn't, right? So you have the original, then you have this mass-produced kitschy knockoff that they sell to the tourists. Yeah. And then what is a step removed from that? Because I myself am a step removed. You have the original African from Africa. Then you have the Cape Verdean, which was brought to, uh, brought to Cape Verde from Africa by the Portuguese. And then you have me, which is a byproduct of that, which is American, right? So that's three steps. So what is another step removed from the kitschy knockoff that I grew up with? I started thinking in terms of material. So with the material, I started thinking, okay, it's made from wood, yeah. hand carved from wood, the original. The knockoff, it's made from wood, more than, more than likely it's machine, it's made by machine. Okay, then what's, what's the derivative of wood? What's another byproduct of wood that also speaks to American society? And I immediately came up with cardboard. Mm. You know, it comes from the same plant, if you want to be, you know, general about it. But it also speaks on American society in a sense. So we have the idea of boxes, right? Packaging, mm -hmm. shipping. Also ties in with packaging and shipping of a people, right? Because yeah. Cape Verdeans are, were packaged and shipped. Yeah. Slaves were packaged and shipped for the benefits of others. So in American society, we have boxes. A lot of us now, especially in COVID, we get everything in the mail. No one wants to go to the store. We're ordering on Amazon like it's nobody's business. And everything comes in a box. It's packaged and shipped. Mm -hmm. So with this, I'm, I'm kind of creating, um, I'm kind of creating a narrative with yeah. that. Um, and I chose to create it in the, in the shape of a woman, a female form, because uh, African women and African American women throughout history have been so hypersexualized that I wanted to really turn that on its head, right? So uh, in today's society, we, we see a lot of them in magazines and how other cultures try to portray themselves like us, whether it be you know tans and bronzer to uh, lip fillers, lip and fillers implants, implants and injections, mm -hmm. even to the hairstyles, right? Everyone wants to imitate the original. So with this, I try to highlight certain things that you know might have been viewed as not so um, pleasant, right? So we have, you know, the large, luscious lips. Mm -hmm. We have the nose that's very uh, wide, wide yeah. right? And then we have here, we have breasts that are large. Mm -hmm. Even um, we were having a conversation about it the other day yes. where I was referencing a Venus of Windedorf, you know, the, the voluptuous figure with the breasts, you know, it's not about hypersexualizing it, but it's about understanding that it's, it's about love, it's about nurture, it's about growing, it's about life, you know. Um, and all of this is what creates life. Um, so I wanted to take something that was viewed negatively um, in, in society and try to turn it on its head and make it seem more positive. It's almost like reclaiming it in a sense. Um, and then I'm sure a lot of people are gonna feel very controversial about that opinion for you know, good reasons. But you know, we can always have a conversation about that. And then hopefully uh, I can get you to see my point of view. So this is Mother Queen God.
importance behind you using the medium of cardboard. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people when they come to see the show or when they watch it online will be familiar with this sculpture here, this pilau, mm -hmm. as they will see it um, you know, referenced in your painting, Sorat. Yes. So, so yeah, <laughs> so like I had said before with the painting of Sodad, that the pilon is very much the bloodline, the life source of our culture. Food is very important to us. So with these, uh, I created them out of cardboard just to keep the material the same throughout. And then inside you have corn, which is also you know, represented with like, our food. Like, corn is a very huge staple in a lot of our traditional dishes between corn and beans. Um, mixed in with a little cauliflower, some collard greens, you know, different... Um, Got a meal. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Different, you know, vegetables and, and things grown from the ground, potatoes. So food is very much a huge important aspect of our culture. So that's what each of these represent. Okay, Chris, so we have talked about the importance of, of food in your culture. Also, I feel like it's universal. It's like black culture in general. Yeah, I absolutely. feel like everybody can commune and congregate around, you know, the symbols of gathering together and food and bread being shared and broken. So yeah. talk to me about these final three sculptures that we have in your show. So here we have fork, spoon, knife, or as I would call it, garf, clear, faka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and these are very nostalgic to me um, because growing up, I would see in a lot of like my aunt's kitchens, these carved out wooden spoons, forks, and knives just hanging up on the walls as decorations. So this is kind of like an homage to my childhood, mm -hmm. and it's very nostalgic for me. So I created my own renditions, my own versions of them, with my own little sculptures attached to the top. And like you said, it's all about breaking bread, it's about community, and it's about sharing a, a loving experience with ones you, know, you call family and friends. a show in Black History Month without showing the symbol that a lot of Blacks globally recognize as a symbol of, of power, a symbol of strength. Uh, so talk to us about these five sculptures that we have here. Yes. So all of these are based off of the Black Power Fist. Um, and it's really a symbol of, like you said, you know, power, um, resilience, and revolution within African and other Black cultures. Um, especially in African-American uh, culture and society, you know, we see these um, a lot in protests, mm -hmm. you know, when people uh, want to stand up for their rights or want to stand up for, you know, um, other people of color. We, we see them revolting or we see them gathering in, in sense of protest um, to, to raise awareness of the importance of black life um, and black bodies. Um, so this is a representation of that and it also ties in with African or I should say Cape Verdean um, culture and African culture too, you know, with, even with apartheid in South Africa mm -hmm. to, the, to the revolution in Cape Verde um, where we gained our independence. Um, it's all about liberating the black body, liberating the black mind and that's what these uh, sculptures represent. So that leads us into what we are standing in front of, you know, our installation wall yes. for the show. Uh, a very strong, very powerful piece. You mentioned uh, to me previously and seeing some of your past work that this is, I don't know, an extension maybe might be a good word yeah. of a piece that you did um, in previous show. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about uh, saying our name as well. Right. So with this, I created an image to represent really every black person in America that was murdered unjustly at the hands of law enforcement in all of 2020. So from the top to the bottom, there are names of black women, black children, and black men who have been unjustly murdered, and I will say murdered, by police. Um, so with this, I use a noose to represent the lynching of these people because they were lynched. And now instead of using it as hanging from trees, now we're getting lynched by the guns. 
of officers, of you know, white supremacists. And that all ties together historically as, as we might think that in, you know, those days are over, you know, that's all in the past. No, it's still very present and very relevant today. And it's just changed as far as the, the style of execution. You know, before they would have almost like lynching parties where people would come and gather to see a black man being hung. Now we have social media where we have people watching black men get killed by guns or knees to the neck almost every day. You know, there's another video of an unarmed black person getting um, abused and getting murdered by other individuals, um, whether it be police or white supremacists. So this is a representation of that, and it's very important that we know their names, because these are the people who are victims, right? And, you know, let media tell you one way or another, they might paint a different picture, but at the end of the day, in my opinion, if a person of, who's not of color commits a crime, i.e. shooting up a church or a school, they can get handcuffed put into a car and have their day in court. But a man sitting in a car with his wife and his child, reaching for his wallet, will get shot dead in his car in front of his family for absolutely no reason, has no trial, has no justice. So this is what that is a representation of. This is a call for justice, and this is a memorial to those people. Okay, so one of the things that I love allowing everybody to experience in your show is that we do have such a great mixture of sculptures, paintings, and then we're finally ending on here, which is your fabric, your yes. tapestry work. So when you first told me, hey, I'm thinking about doing, you know, flags, I was just like, okay, I'm excited to see what this turns into or what it turned out to be. Yes. And I was astonished. I, I absolutely love these. So. Um, you know, for our viewers online, for the people who are going to be visiting the show in person. Let's talk about these two. Awesome, yes. So we have the Cape Verde flag here represented, and then we have what I like to call the Afro-American flag. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, you know, I use African fabrics to create the, the image of the flag um, because if you really think about it, African culture and African history is so deeply woven and intertwined in the fabrics of our society mm -hmm. from the inception of the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, it was stolen from the indigenous people mm -hmm. and built on the backs of Africans. Um, and even today in, our, in, in popular culture, we have uh, a chance to see African culture being pushed to the forefront, whether it be music, whether it be art, um, style, fashion it's very rooted in african and it's very rooted in african-american experiences so this is a representation of how africans and african-americans have influenced the culture that we live in today and the same thing goes for this flag right so like i had told you guys before the cape Verdean islands were uninhabited until africans were brought there for transatlantic slave and colonized by the portuguese Till this day, there are very, there's quite a few actually, um, older generations of people that live there um, that don't think they're African. Mm. They're still stuck in this colonialist mentality that they're not African, they're Portuguese. Wow. So they view themselves almost as, as better than, mm -hmm. you know, an African. When in reality, you're as African as it gets. You know, you're rooted in African history. You're rooted in African culture to the food, to the language, even to the music, which if you guys come tonight, you will hear lots of that music. So um, it's very rooted in an African experience. So our countries are both rooted in Africa, and me, myself, am a product of both of these countries. So me, myself, I'm also rooted in Africa, hence the name of the title of the show, Roots Chaizish. Everything that I've made and everything that I'm doing is rooted in the African experience and the African-American experience. So this is me. Thank you for joining us for our artist and curator talk with Chris Santos and Sorsha Beatty. 
As a reminder, all of the art that you've seen today can be purchased online at downtownartsdistrict.com. Access being Black in the art world could not have happened without the generosity of our program and annual sponsors. We are the proud recipients of the Diversity and Accessibility Grant from the United Arts of Central Florida. In support of that grant, we received a generous matching gift by an anonymous company that has been a longtime supporter of the Downtown Arts District. Thank you very much to Access's additional supporters Tiffany Sanders, City of Orlando, Orange County Arts and Cultural Affairs, the Downtown Development Board, the State of Florida Division of Cultural Affairs, and Remixed.